Uh, we today have Dr. Brad Swanson. I will let him introduce himself. He's from Central uh, Michigan University. But my question to Brad is, what made you want to be a scientist and a researcher? All right, well, let's try sharing my screen. Is that working? Okay, all right, so what made me want to become, so I'm Brad Swanson. I've been at Central for about 20 years. Um, did an undergraduate at University of Michigan, um, master's at University of Idaho, and a PhD at Purdue. What got me into wanting to be a scientist and a biologist in particular was probably growing up right next to the Brighton State Recreation Area. Um, my parents' property bordered it on two sides. It kind of wrapped around us. And nearest neighbor was a mile away uh, so I had lots of time and energy to go running around in the woods and I think that's really what got me involved in it. Um, got to see all kinds of cool things while we were wandering around taking the dogs for walks and just just spending time in the woods. Uh, so that, that's what really got me going um, and it's been a, a really cool experience so far. I've gotten to work on lots of different critters. Um, these are some of the things which I've worked with. I've Worked on uh, red fox in Yellowstone National Park for a couple of years during my PhD. We've done uh, pine marten work in Michigan, bobcat work looking at poaching and population distributions in Michigan, river otters in Oregon and Michigan, American badgers in Michigan, eastern Massasauga rattlesnakes, some of the stuff that's been going on with Jen Moore at PCCI. We did a blue racer project also at PCCI kangaroo rats in southeastern Arizona, the little bottom one in the middle, um, black-footed ferrets, the upper right one, that's a little black-footed ferret kit, uh, relatively newly born from in the captive breeding facilities. We've worked with them up in South Dakota. Uh, deer, deer mice, white-footed mice also at Pierce Cedar Creek, wolves in Wisconsin, fishers in Michigan, and lots of other insects, amphibians, reptiles, plants, and stuff like that. But what we're going to talk about today are two to three projects. Um, the first one is going to be one that usually gets a fair bit of attention because we were working up in the Arctic on the um, shore fast ice looking at ring seals, Pusa hispida. And our main project was trying to look at movement patterns with a couple of different techniques and thinking about from the conservation standpoint issues of them. One of the surprising things about ring seals is they're the, probably the most common marine mammal in the world. Population sizes are estimated to be around 10 million of these individuals. But a few years ago, despite those population sizes, they were um, put on the threatened and endangered list under the um, Endangered Species Act for, as a threatened species. And this is, of course, due to climate change that we're seeing in the Arctic. Now you still have to kind of wonder why if we have 10 million individuals, why would they ever be a candidate for listing? Ring seals are what we call one of our ice dependent breeding seals. So they must live, they must have ice in order to breed. And with climate change, we're starting to see less ice. Ice is lasting less long. We're getting less snowfall and the snowfall is lasting less long. So, and the patterns as to where the ice is breaking up and when it's breaking up changes all the time. So why they're ice dependent is they, they need to build snow caves in order to give birth. So what you can see here is just an image of the ring seal and they carve out a hole through the ice layer. They need to have this region here where the ice chunks are crashing into each other, breaking up, they make a little mound that mound then collects the snow from the windward side and builds this little cave. They have these incredibly big, thick claws to help dig them through the ice layer, which can be certainly several feet thick at various times. And then they will excavate this little cave underneath it. The ring seal itself, the adult doesn't need it because it's got enough blubber and to be able to survive in the Arctic Ocean during any time of the year but the pups are the problem. When the pups are born, they don't have that blubber layer that one would see with uh, whales or some of the walruses and stuff like that. So if that pup actually ended up in the ocean, it would go hypothermic and die very quickly. The 
Ring seals have an incredibly rich milk. It has some of the highest fat content of any of the marine mammals. So the pups put on weight very quickly and are able to enter the ocean and start swimming around. But during that initial nursing period, they need to be in that cave to protect them from the elements, both temperature and wind. Now the problem we have with climate change is that the cave roof that we see up here, if you can see my cursor moving, that tends to get thinner and thinner as climate gets warmer and warmer, and that has two possible impacts. One is that polar bears are hunting these seals, and <clears throat> the thickness of the snow and the icy covering can make it really difficult for the polar bears to be able to punch through. They actually are hopping up and down using their front legs as battering rams to crack through. The thinner the uh, cap, the easier it is for the polar bears to get through and find that squishy little treat on the inside. The other problem we have is just that the cave roofs will actually collapse themselves, exposing the ring seal pups to the environment before they're able to withstand that climate and they will end up just dying on the ice before they can go anywhere. So our questions really were related to, okay, we know there's lots of these ring seals. We know that they are moving all over the place, um, but the question is, given the sporadic nature and haphazard nature of where ice will last, how long it will last, how the snow will be, would the ring seals move or be able to even move from one location to the next so that they could breed where the ice and um, snow conditions are the best? So what we needed to do was find our ring seals. Now we had a bit of an advantage in that we know that they have their snow caves where they would end up having been with the pups we really didn't want to work with them in the snow cave scenario because of we'd have to crawl in there, the moms are incredibly protective, we might damage it, we might attract polar bears to there or anything else. So we needed a different way to try and capture the ring seals. So being mammals, they have to breathe. And what they do is they create these oglus. And an oglu is just the Inuit word for the hole that they make when they come up and have a breathing um, hole for it. So you can see here, this is a ring seal just sticking its snout just out of the water. They try to minimize their exposure and will actually hide underneath that aglu, waiting and waiting sometimes for 15, 20 minutes to see if there's any shadows moving around or anything else that might be a polar bear waiting to stick a claw into it and grab it up as it comes up for a breath. Then when it comes up for a breath, it's gonna stick its nose up really quickly, inhale a big, huge gulp of air and disappear as fast as it can. Now, we knew that, we know polar bears can find these through using scent. That's how they end up finding the seal breathing holes. They wouldn't be able to survive just randomly finding them. So my collaborator at University of Alaska Southeast at the time, Brendan Kelly, decided that if polar bears can smell out these holes, dogs should be able to smell out these holes. So we trained up a set of dogs to sniff out the seal breathing holes up on the Arctic ice sheets. So what we would do for our field work is we would fly up all of our equipment up to um, the North Shore of Alaska, load up all of our snowmobiles and take it out onto the shore fast ice and then we would be living out on the ice for a couple of months. This next slide is just gonna be a image of one of our better camps. It's actually a more permanent type of camp. It's not permanent because we're on the ice we don't take it all off in time, the ice melts and it all falls into the water. Um, but the other thing I want you to do is listen because it'll give you an idea of what the wind is like at up on the Arctic where we were working. So incredibly windy, incredibly powerful. <clears throat> so um, we go out, we have our, our dogs trained, we run out and find the seal breathing holes and then we would deploy these nets. And so you can kind of see the nets right here. Um, we're at a seal breathing hole. We're gonna lower the net into the breathing hole. And then you notice there's a whole lot of other equipment and in particular, these two antennas. Well, we can't, we have a lot of these nets deployed across the ice sheets. And so we can't sit at each one of those. A, it's too cold and windy, we'd freeze to death. And B, we didn't have enough people to be able to do that. So we needed to have a way that we could get the signal back to our base camp. Here's a picture inside um, one of our huts of John Moran. And I don't know if you can see it, but here is the level of the snow. 
So that's our snow line right there in our window. So we needed to be able to have a way to get signals that the seals were actually in the seal breathing hole. So we set up this system where this is the net, seal would come through, it would start breathing. We had a microphone placed there. We would hear the seal breathe. It would transmit the signal from that radio antenna to our base camp. From the base camp, we could then push this doorbell, literally, signal the trap at the location where the seal was, the weight would fall down, and we would trap the seal in that net that you saw. We always made sure that the nets were deep enough so that the seal could get underneath the ice if it needed to and avoid the polar bear. But by being able to avoid the polar bear, it also meant that it was very difficult for us to get the seal out. So this is a picture of one of my students, Stephanie Sell, reaching into the Arctic Ocean trying to find the seal. And yes, her head is pretty well in the Arctic Ocean trying to grab the seal. Once you would grab the seal, you had to try and get it out. There we go. Head off. Go ahead. So, John Moran, got a seal. He's got it by the hind foot. Look at that. Come on, John. Two more kettles. 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 Good boy. And so that was pulling one of the seals out of the seal breathing hole. We'd wrap them up. Um, this is Steph actually wrapping up one of the seals. The nut chuck is Inuit for the ring seal, um, just in case you were wondering why they were saying that. So we would then take and we would have a, we had a specially developed pair of pliers which would take a hole punch out of this um, cartilaginous portion of the rear flippers of the ring seal and into the rings and into those holes, we would put one tag, this red one, which was a sonic tag. We had deployed a series of buoys underneath in the local area so we could get three-dimensional movement patterns as the sonic um, pinger would be recorded. And then we had another one, this black one here, which was a GPS satellite tag. So every three days for the next year, whenever the field, a seal's flipper popped out of the water, it would send a signal up to the satellite and we could trace its movements. So we would take this, the um, skin punch for genetic analysis, put in these tags, and let the animal go. Okay, uh, okay. This is May 9th. May 9th, 2005. Ida is going back. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> that's kind of what the techniques look like. Um, there was blood because we were taking a, a sample that we needed for genetic analysis as well. But we ended up sampling from sites all over the Arctic. The ring seals are circumpolar. So we had in the Chukchi Sea, we had some from Kotzebue, Purd Bay in the Beaufort Sea, Prudhoe Bay, Pectoa, Tuktiuktuk, Coleman, Bothnia Bay, and one of the coolest sites was in Lake Saima. Lake Saima is a freshwater lake that used to be connected to the Baltic but with um, reductions in sea levels, it isolated Lake Simo and captured a population of ring seals in there. And so they have evolved to be freshwater seals now. So that's really cool. Highly endangered, very small populations, but still very cool. So we want to see how far these ring seals would move in a year and if they were coming back to where they were before. So this is one adult male ring seal. We caught it just off of Purd Bay in uh, May 25th. Just about two months later, it had moved over 3,000 km, 3, kilometers to the east. Two months later, three months later, it was about 2,000 kilometers further west. In one month, it moved again, almost 3,000 kilometers to only return in March right back to the same location we had caught it a year earlier. So when we looked at our sonograms of these individuals, what we would see is that they were highly localized and that both males and females were returning to almost the exact same spots and breeding in the exact same spot that they did the last year. They were usually within one kilometer of where they bred the previous year 
despite the fact that they might have traveled 12,000 kilometers in the meantime. So this made us concerned about the fact that they seem to be highly localized. So then we decided, okay, we need to expand our sampling and we needed to get more genetic analysis to try and look at what the genetics look like. This is Steph. Um, we're just cruising around with the dogs looking for seal breathing holes. Uh, you can see she's carrying a shotgun. You always carried a shotgun with slugs because of polar bears. Um, that would be a very bad thing to run into them. We did have the camp explored every once in a while by polar bears. They would usually come at night and they would essentially taste everything that was loose and just you come up and next morning everything was chewed on by a polar bear. So what we needed to do from the genetic standpoint though was try and get lots of samples from lots of individuals. And this was, uh, this is a photo of a seal basking. This is the molting time, usually May to July. During this time, the seals pop out, sit on the ice, and they literally just start there and let the sun warm up their body temperature, and it causes them to flake off their skin cells. So it's like a really bad case of dandruff. And one of the things it does is help get rid of um, ectoparasites they have. And they would sit in the same spot and they would sit there so long, they would actually melt a pan in the snow and ice, but they would be, leave behind all these little black flecks. And each one of these little black flecks is a set of skin cells. So my idea was we could probably collect those skin cells and take them back to CMU for genetic analysis. Now the problem is each skin cell could be from a different animal. So Stephanie had to go through and pick out one single individual skin fleck and put it into uh, one of those coin envelopes and then do the next one and the next one to avoid contamination. She also had to, and you heard the wind, she had to manage to take a lighter and flame sterilize her probe each time she collected a new skin sample. So this was not all that promising either. It was a lot of work, really difficult, um, but Steph was a trooper, managed to get it all done. And what we found out and probably not the greatest news for the ring seals is that each one of those populations was relatively isolated. There's not a lot of movement of individual animals between any of those individual sites. So it doesn't bode well for the animals being able to adapt to the variable conditions that they're likely to experience under climate change as ice, is, ice doesn't last as long in one place or another. They're almost certainly going to go back to those same places. They'll start to breed the ice will collapse and will probably have reproductive failures, which is part of the reason why they have been uh, put on the T&E list. So that was our ring seal um, study that we did. That was multiple years running up onto the Arctic ice as we went. So if you folks have some questions, I'm happy to try and answer them or we can continue on. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or type them into the chat box. Um, we'll wait just a couple of seconds to see if anybody does. Otherwise, we'll keep going. I uh, just want to make sure it's timely on questions because if you're anything like me, I forget my questions <laughs> if I wait till the end. So we'll wait a couple more seconds and otherwise we'll just go on. And if you have a question that pops up later, we'll try to address it later. Okay. So, so the next one we wanted to talk about was kind of another unique technique um, that we developed. Uh, to try and estimate number of individuals and identify individuals. And this was a project that was done at Pierce Cedar Creek and supported through the ERG grant. So realize any of you who are members or donating, this is something that actually came out of that. So well done you, thank you very much. Um, the undergraduate actually got this published too in a scientific journal, American Midland Naturals. So this was trying to estimate how many raccoons were running around at Pierce Cedar Creek. And we wanted to do it in a non-invasive fashion so that we weren't ever gonna have to handle the raccoons. Um, handling the raccoons is bad for the raccoons and it's bad for the researcher. Anytime you handle animals and capture them, there's a probability they're gonna die. There's a probability you're going to be bit. It's just, if we can avoid doing it, we really tried to do that. Um, so we decided to try and use fingerprints. So this is a human fingerprint. This is what they would be looking at if you ever get your fingerprints taken for whatever reason, identification purposes or whatnot. In human fingerprints, we have these ridges, and they're usually continuous ridges, but we can have different locations within them where fingerprint experts will try and identify them. So we can have a terminus 
where we have a line end. We can have crossing over where two lines intersect and cross over. We can have a bifurcation where one line splits into two, all these different characteristics. Now the problem is, <coughs> is that non-human mammals don't have ridges. They just have papillae, they have little dots. We think we have the ridges and the papillae to facilitate manipulation of items and that it increases our surface area so we can get a better grip on it. So one of my colleagues, uh, Roland Kays, at, who is now at the uh, North Carolina State Museum, thought maybe we could do something with non-human animals, non-human mammals, to try and identify them with their fingerprints as well. We needed to have something that had a relatively big paw, and so he decided to try it with some of the museum specimens that they had of fishers. And this is a fisher that's um, part of a uh, study we were doing that has one radio collar here, but you can see the size of the pads there. And this is what the pad would look like. And the area outlined in yellow is all the area that would have the papillion. So Roland had a bunch of museum specimens and he would take and put the pads onto an ink pad and then transfer it to a piece of paper. And this is what the um, pattern would look like. And you can see that there are all these little dots all around there. And so the idea was, are those unique so that we can identify individual animals based on those? So these are three prints from his museum specimens. And what you can see is they're all taken from approximately the same location on the pad. And when you look at the patterns, they look really, really different. Now, it's one thing to just say, yeah, they look different, but we wanted to try and come up with a way that you could quickly go through them and decide whether they match or not. And so um, we came up with this technique using a program called ImageJ, where you would take the picture of the same spot on the, um, on whatever animal you were looking at, in this case, the fisher, and you would take two of the images and you would flip quickly, flip back and forth between them. And when they were a match, you would get this rotational view. Now, if they didn't match, you would see something that looks like this. It just doesn't look like it's moving. It just looks like, okay, yeah, those are really different. And so using this technique, you could quickly go through and identify them. My undergraduate, Stephanie uh, Ellison, wanted to try and do that with raccoons though. So this is uh, the rear foot of a raccoon, really big. You, everybody knows how good they are with their hands, so we figured there would be a lot of papillae. It'd be an easy one to try and maybe do, extend the technique off of fissures um, and see if it would work. We had done a field study on fissures up in the Upper Peninsula with a graduate student, and he showed that it does work in the wild, not just with museum specimens. So he spent a summer living up in the forest of the Upper Peninsula, fingerprinting fissures. Um, and Stephanie then wanted to try it with raccoons. So we build these little cubbies, and the cubby is triangular. It's just made out of corrugated plastic, so essentially plastic cardboard. Inside the cubby, we would have a sheet of aluminum, and the front half of it would be coated with non-toxic um, copy toner. The back half of it would be coated with just um, contact paper. And then in the far back here, we had bait, which in this case was a wad of peanut butter. So the raccoon would walk in, put its foot onto the copy toner, and then walk for backwards to get to the peanut butter, transferring its prints onto the contact paper. And then hopefully we will get usable prints out of them. So Steph gridded out the whole Pierce Cedar Creek property. Each dot was a track cubby. And we started um, trying to capture our raccoon prints. One of the issues we found at Pierce Cedar Creek is they have an abundance of slugs and the slugs were really attracted to the peanut butter or something in there and so we would have lots and lots of slugs getting in there <clears throat> and they would ruin the tracks. You can see these slug slides all this place where it looks just like a smear and it would ruin our ability to use those um, use those prints. So what we did find what Stephanie figured out was we could just sprinkle some diatomaceous earth in front of the traps and the slugs wouldn't cross it so that we were able to get much cleaner and clearer prints such as something like this. What we had to do then once we got each one of the prints was first of all take a look at the coarse scale 
of trying to identify our fingerprints. This is just showing a front left paw print, a front right paw print. These are their equivalent of their thumbs, of our thumbs right here, a rear left footprint and a rear right footprint. Now, the one thing we found was that the front paw prints, the papillae are too close together. We couldn't get individual distinct papillae patterns. So we weren't able to use any of the front feet, but you can see even the density just from looking at these images, the papillae patterns, they just, there's not as much black, there's more white. So we were able to use our rear feet. So what Steph would have to do is go through each one of our individual track plates, pick up the co uh, contact paper, bring it back, identify which foot was which, <clears throat> whether they were backs or fronts, and then would have to try, and that was our core scale, just find the back feet. Then she would have to go to an intermediate scale of identification. That's looking at these creases and scars. So for example, you can see there's a big gap <clears throat> of papillae right here where there's a white line. So there wasn't anything there. So an intermediate scale, Stephanie would try and identify patterns that looked like they were similar enough that they would be worthwhile trying to do our flip-flop back and forth. Right now we have four different prints up and I'm not sure if you folks can guess how many different raccoons we have. Take a second or two and try and see what you would come up with. And if you look at that scarring pattern and the fold patterns, you should see that we had three different raccoons. The, these are in the same orientation. So this was the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And what Stephanie has done here is she's actually now highlighted the similarity in those patterns. And you can see that those two bottom ones match really well, and none of them really match with either of the other two. So Steph was able to go through and identify all of the raccoons <clears throat> at Pierce Cedar Creek. This was the distribution of them and how many different um, captures we had. You can see that they like to hang around areas of water. We have darker or warmer colors, uh, the red colors near the water, and of course near humans. So she published this. And then the cool part was this summer, we were supposed to be in New York City working at the parks because they wanted to use this technique to identify how many raccoons were running around in the New York City park system. Obviously, COVID had a bit of an impact on that, and we're hoping that we might be able to do this again next year. We did find out <clears throat> that the number of raccoons in Pierce Cedar Creek, depending on um, how many we had, we had there's roughly somewhere between about 20 and 100 raccoons running around in Pierce Cedar Creek. It's a broad number, but it's because we only had a short period of time to do the study. We could refine that if we, if we would have had a longer period of time. So the last one I'm going to try and get through in just a few moments here <clears throat> was trying to look at bears in the upper peninsula, or I'm sorry, in the lower peninsula, <clears throat> and trying to determine how many there were and where they're located. Typically, when you try and do this type of a study, you have to live capture the bears, and that's what you see in the upper left-hand corner. That is a bear capture container. You bait it, you wait, and you wait, you wait, the bear kind of goes in grabs the bait, the gate falls down behind it, and then you can tranquilize the bear, put a radio collar on it, ear tags, as you see here, <clears throat> but then you need to recapture it again, and you have to do this over and over and over again to try and figure out how many animals there are. That makes it difficult, it's dangerous for bears, it's dangerous for the scientists. So we wanted to use a slightly different way, which was using their hair. This is an image of a piece of hair, this is the shaft of the hair, the stuff you folks are used to combing <coughs> um, down at the bottom. And then the sheath running around it all up at the top here is the follicle. When hair falls out naturally, it's because the follicle is dead, the hair falls out, new follicle grows, new hair comes out of it. When it falls out, there's no DNA left behind. If you yank it out though, you pull the follicle as well and you can, and you can get DNA out of that. <coughs> so what we had been working with was MSU had done a fabulous study looking and very intensive, lots of time, lots of effort sampling. These are bear management units from back in 2006 when we were doing the study. They sampled heavily in the Red Oak District and the Baldwin District, and they found a, there were about 1,900 bears in the Lower Peninsula was their um, 
prediction. Now, we were working with the tribal, with the little uh, river band of Adawa, and they were interested. Some of their individuals are from the bear clan, and they were surprised at the number of bears because in their treaty ceded lands, they don't find a whole lot of bears. So they were worried that things weren't evenly distributed. So this is our study area. They want to say, okay, how many bears are in Baldwin? So we decided to grid out that roughly 13,000 square kilometers. We made 32 and a half square kilometer grids. Each one of those squares was a grid. In each one of those grids, we put a bear hair snare <coughs> to try and capture the, um, to try and pull hairs from individual bears. And this is what they look like. So what you have here is you can see we have barbed wire in a triangular shape around a tree. And then up here, you can see a wad of bacon. The bacon is there to attract the bear. So ideally, the bear comes by, sees the bacon, runs in, grabs it, leaves some hair behind on one of the barbed wires, and hopefully leaves some additional bear be, uh, some hair behind on barbed wires as well. You only have a few days to go in and get these. So my grad student, Todd, had to come every couple of days and go through, collect all, oh, collect all of the samples, oh, pull them out, put them into individual bags. He had to flame every um, barbed wire pull then so that it was sterile and we couldn't get contamination. He would rebate and collect the rest of the hair snares and have our samples. So here's a one where we actually had a camera set up. You can see the bear is actually inside the triangular area. And this is what the samples would look like. <clears throat> so now the problem was is that that could be multiple bears on that one piece of barbed wire. So Todd had to go through, and just like we were using those single little flecks of skin cells, Todd had to do all of his work off of one single strand of hair for each bear to do the genetic work. And when we finished up, what we found out was the Baldwin district seemed to have a lot fewer bears than you might expect. They tended to be clustered together, and we only found about 100 to 120 bears in the region. So this would suggest that <clears throat> the distribution of bears with roughly 18, 1900 of them throughout the region were most heavily associated with the Red Oak area, with the Red Oak district. So that when harvesting is being done, the number of permits that one should be issuing should be representative, representative of what the expected populations were. And so probably maybe more harvesting out of Red Oak and less out of Baldwin and Gladwin area. So, okay, I made it with two minutes to spare. So I'm happy to just pop out and ask, answer any questions that you might have or anything else. Awesome. So we got a question coming in. Uh, Lane was wondering, these methods of identification and tracking density are obviously much less invasive and safer. Are you seeing similar methods being used or attempted more readily with other species now? Yeah, we've, um, the goal nowadays is, as much as all of us biologists love to see and handle the animals, the goals nowadays really are to never see and never touch them we can get so much information out of these non-invasive techniques that that's definitely becoming the way we try and answer a lot of questions. We can't get, we can't get fine scale movement patterns so often with some of these. The fingerprinting technique <clears throat> is very limited by the size of the paw. I don't think it'll ever work for anything smaller than a raccoon. So we wouldn't be able to use some of that. And so for those type of studies, if we really need to see where they're going and how they're moving, we still need to use the radio collars, but now we pretty much always are able to use GPS collars with satellite links like we had with the ring seals so that we can get continuous locations without ever having to actually capture the animal again or even try and go out. So the whole goal behind most wildlife, <clears throat> most wildlife biology now is to minimize the impacts on animals by capturing them as infrequently as possible and never if we, if we can avoid it. <coughs> Awesome, Brad. What about, I had a question. You said you, there were 20 to 100 raccoons in, uh, in, at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. I know raccoons have been a big problem with our last virtual lunch and learn that we were talking about with turtles. Is there a way to figure out what raccoons are 
eating our turtle eggs? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty easy. All of them. Nope. <laughs> They all are perfectly happy to eat a, eat the turtle eggs when you can find them. It's just, we have uh, on my property up here in Mount Pleasant, we have wood turtles all over the place. When we did, a, one of my grad students worked with wood turtles and I think we captured 23 wood turtles on our property alone and we're a nesting site too. Um, you know, it's, and the vast majority of our nesting sites always get dug up by raccoons. It's, it's just, that's what they've evolved to do. They've got great noses to smell out the eggs. And so, you know, you have to really work hard like um, PCCI does to cover those up. So when we find a spot where we know the wood, wood turtles have nested, we'll try and cage it up on our property too, just to keep the raccoons out. But yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> they're just always going to find it. It's just such a fabulous energy source for them. It's, you're, you're we're never going to, reduce that so that set of mortality yeah fritz was in the middle of a question so if he wants to kind of you might want to continue with that asking some about the bears yeah as far as the bears uh you had uh the grand travers baldwin area and then you were in gaylord you had a gaylord area do you ever have them traveling back and forth across the territory oh yeah yeah um the the bears unfortunately do not respect the bear management areas for some reason they didn't get the memo that they're not supposed to leave the baldwin and go into red oaks or red oaks and go to gladwin so they definitely yeah. do travel back and forth between them mm -hmm. but the 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 home range of the bears is if you remember those cells it was only about four of those cells mm -hmm. um it was about a four square cell would be a typical bear territory so it's unlikely we have large numbers moving back and forth. So when we did the bear study, we actually took and made a four square buffer around um, the, the um, uh, Baldwin area and we excluded all the bears from there because we were afraid that those might be bears which could be counted in both sites. So we tried to correct for the fact that those animals would be moving back and forth. Okay. Thank you. you does it, anyone else want to ask? Uh, I know there's one more question in the chat, but does anybody else want to talk about what they discussed in their chat room? You can unmute yourself or type it in the chat if you would like. I know one thing we had wondered. No. Um, hey, guys. Stop. Um, one thing I had wondered was advice on on raccoons and management as far as the institute you know you have been doing research out out of the institute what ideas do you have as far as if we wanted to manage them differently what do you think would be some options oh that is just i mean if you want to help the turtles the management option is removal with however one wants to do that. Um, not many people will want more raccoons in their area. Raccoons hit pretty high densities as it is. So you're probably talking, would be talking lethal removal. Um, that's, that's really about it. The problem that you often create then though is that that will leave a vacuum um, and you'll probably just get more raccoons coming in to fill those empty territories. One of, um, one of the researchers up here at CMU works on development of corn. So she has a small corn field that she plants every year. And I'm the raccoon management team for her um, corn plot to keep them out of there. And I literally am trapping, and then we take, we take all of the raccoons we trap, we bring them up to a, another CMU location, um, one of our properties, which is 30 minute drive, drop them there, and I catch raccoons in that same, you know, what, maybe 100 by 100 foot square plot all summer long. So that's the problem is they just start filling, moving in to fill those vacuums, so. All right, I think we're gonna end with one last question we had in the chat box. Uh, which populations, we've talked a lot about which populations are dwindling and all that stuff, but, um, 
which mammals do you think have the largest populations in Michigan, other than raccoons? <laughs> oh, uh, it, raccoons are certainly not the largest. The largest okay. populations are going to be our one of our one of the mice or one of the vole species, um, just because of the sheer size relative to their to the area that we have. The small mammals are always going to be the dominant. Um, numerically dominant individuals and and realistically probably biomass dominated too even relative to any of the other mammals um, doesn't mean that they're all all of the species are doing well uh, the kangaroo rats the ones we worked on were fine but there's several of the kangaroo rats which are you know only about yay big to about yay big um, that are endangered and threatened so just being small doesn't mean that your population size is healthy, but that's certainly where we're going to have the, the most any of any individuals of any type. So makes sense. Food pyramid wise. Yeah. Most exactly. at the bottom, right? Exactly. There's a lot more prey than there are predators. <laughs> oh, hopefully in that sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Brad, so much for sharing all your great stories. Um, I just want to join us for another program. Check us out on Facebook or our website to see what's coming up. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for watching. Bye guys.